Hello, this is Matthew Robert Payne, and with me is Tulu Johnson. Uh, if you watch uh, our videos, Mentoring in the Heavenlies, you'll know that Tulu asks the questions, and uh, the saint speaks through me today. Uh, God is going to speak through me, and different to normal times, uh, Tulu Johnson didn't make up the questions this time. I made up the questions. Uh, so I'm sort of happy about that, but Tulu makes good questions too. And uh, so you wouldn't have come across uh, many videos if you're watching that playlist. Uh, in that playlist, I made up the questions for Bethany, my angel, and I also made up the questions for John Lennon, but I don't often make up the questions, but in this one, I made up the questions. Not only is God going to answer the questions in this one, uh, but uh, Tulu is uh, maybe going to comment on God's answers and maybe ask a further question. And uh, sometimes I'm going to comment on uh, God's answer and ask a further question or, or give commentary. And uh, it'll be like an online ongoing dialogue as we go through the questions. Okay, with that being said, uh, we'll start the interview uh, with question one. Thank you, Matthew. So God is here now. So the first question is, there's a lot of talk about rapture. How soon is the rapture going to be, God? So Matthew was having a conversation with a girl uh, over the internet today, and she said that there was talk about the red heifer in Jerusalem maybe being sacrificed recently around uh, the the uh, eclipse. Um, he's not sure whether she said the red heifer was sacrificed or it wasn't, but the red heifer is going to be used in the temple sacrifices in the new temple. There's actually... Um, three signs that Matthew knows about um, that are, are going to have to be fulfilled uh, before any rapture. And uh, so most of the people that have visions and dreams and talk about the rapture being imminent, imminent and setting dates and stuff are not aware of these three biblical signs and uh, therefore they uh, place bad dates and stuff. So if you're a person who uh, follows uh, these sort of teachings and people who teach on the rapture, consider these three signs. In the scriptures, it says that um, there's going to come a knowledge of the glory of the world from coast to coast, from east to west. Uh, and that means that uh, normal people, people who don't attend church, maybe believe in me and have a faith in me, but don't attend a temple of Satan and uh, and um, our synagogue of Satan, Jesus mentioned in Revelation. So they, they refuse to uh, go into a, ch a church, but they're aware of the glory of God and what the glory of God is. So Matthew was given a vision one time where two girls were walking down the street and there was two uh, people walking down the street on the opposite side of the street and their, face were glow their faces were glowing like the sunshine. One of the girls said to her friend, can you see those two people? Yeah, she said, what's that on them? Their faces are glowing. And her friend says, oh, that's the glory of God. And her friend says, what's the glory of God? And says, well, it's like power of God. But what I know is if you've ever got a need, if you've got something you need, you can always approach those people and they'll be able to fix it for you. And she said, well, my cousin needs a job. He said, well, let's go over. And they run over there and they say, excuse me, um, You've got the glory of God on you, yes. Um, I, I've got a cousin, he's a mechanic, and he actually needs a job. Would you be able to help us find him a job? And and uh, the the person uh, asked, uh, is, is he an apprentice now? Has he got um, years of trade? He says, yeah, he's a third-year apprentice. He said, wait a sec. 
He gets on his cell phone and rings a number and puts a person on the phone to the girl. She exchanges the details of her her cousin and and uh, she gets off the phone all happy that uh, the person on the other end of the phone is going to ring her cousin and offer him a job and they walk away. And so these people in the future are going to be sons of God. They mentioned in Isaiah chapter 60 and they're going to have the glory of God on them. They're going to walk around and they're going to be shining like the sun and everyone who needs healing, everyone who has a need is going to approach these people and these people are going to be winning to people to Christ, doing healings, doing signs and wonders, having provision. People are just going to be walking up to them and giving them thousands of dollars because they know that these are really authentic. The thing about the glory of God is that it won't be able to be counterfeited by Satan. Satan will have no drug or anything that can make people shine like that. And um, sometimes the people will be shining like the sun. Sometimes they'll just have like a glow on their face, like a pregnant woman has that sort of glow. So that knowledge of the glory of God, which is prophesied in Isaiah 60, will be known by everyone in the world. They'll know what the glory of God is, and that's been prophesied. Matthew's not aware of the scripture, but the knowledge of the glory of God will be known throughout the world. And Isaiah 60 talks about the glory coming on people. The glory is going to come on sons of God, and sons of God are people who walk in the Holy Spirit, who are led by the Holy Spirit. And currently, based on Matthew's statistics, that's about 2% of the current church. So that also means that 98% of the current church aren't going to be used in a miraculous mm -hmm. way in the last days. So that's one of the signs. A second sign you may want to look for is if a scripture prophesies that the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple and, and stop the temple sacrifice and set himself up as God, well, that temple has to be built. He's He's got to sit in a real temple. So these people that get on YouTube and say the rapture is next week or there's a full moon and the rapture is here and I've done all this investigation and these signs and these scriptures say this and the rapture's at the end of the month, if there has been no temple built in Israel, they're fools. There's a certain mm -hmm. tribe in, in the Bible, mentioned in the Bible, in the history of Israel, called the tribe of Ishakar. And the tribe of Ishakar used to read signs and wonders and signs in the sky, and they knew the times and the seasons. They could predict things, and they knew when God, when I was going to move and I was going to do things, and they had this special innate ability, this sixth sense, if you will, that could tell when certain specific spiritual things were going to happen. Well, not everyone has the tribe of Ishakar anointing. And if you haven't got that, you can't predict things accurately. So, so many of these YouTube procrastinators, procrastinators, um, prophesy and quote and predict things. And they have no signs. They they don't understand these signs. So one is the temple's got to be built. Two is that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord has got to happen. And three is, you remember the parable that the king uh, had uh, a banquet for his son and he put on a party and prepared the food and uh, mm -hmm. he sent his servants out uh, to collect his friends, and one of them was married, one of them had bought a yoke of oxen, one of them had started a business, and they all gave their excuses to say why they couldn't go to the king's son's wedding. If Prince, Prince Philip or Prince Harry or Prince William was going to be married and they had a wedding feast, and you got an invitation to Prince Harry's wedding, 
would you refuse? Would you have the audacity to refuse? And that's how serious it is. Jesus has sent out his invitation and the church is more interested in the things of the world and the lust of the flesh that they refuse to go out into the half field. They refuse to even come to the rapture. They refuse to make themselves ready and they are like the unwise virgins. And many of them don't walk in the Holy Spirit. Many of them aren't the bride of Christ. And even if a rapture happened tonight, they wouldn't be ready. Uh, so what happened? The king said, well, let's make room. There's room in my house. So he went and got the sinners and the prostitutes and the sex workers and the pedophiles. And he went and got all the sinners and filled his house. Well, that's the third sign. Just before the return of my son, there's going to be great numbers of people coming into the kingdom and all the worst of the worst are going to be attracted. They're not going to necessarily go into churches because churches have become synagogues of Satan. Mm. And a, a witch, if she went into a church and said she was a witch a week ago, they wouldn't let her on the prayer team. They wouldn't let her lay hands on people. They wouldn't, they'd exclude her because they'd think she's an infiltrating witch. If a practicing prostitute came to a church and she hadn't given up her life for prostitution, she'd be scorned. You only have to go to church. Churches are so judgmental and critical and, and uh, defaming of people that uh, the brokenhearted just don't find peace there. They don't find love there. And so this last day's revival is going to be done in brothels. It's going to be in, done in hotels. It's going to be done in gambling establishments. And people, at one or two or three people are going to be gathered together and little clumps of little churches outside the church are going to come. So that's sign number three. So Matthew estimates with the tribe of Ishakar anointing on his life, that the, the, the rapture that people are looking for is going to be 20 to 30 years away. Um, and uh, so that's the answer to this question. Thank you, God. Before, Matthew, have we got anything to say to that? Uh, so I just want to uh, say, uh, uh, God, that uh, you're very passionate. I, I knew uh, that information does it really upset you uh, that uh, that's all the church is focused? Why are they focused on that? Uh, the church is focused on that because they hate what's happening to the world. Mm. The church sees gay marriage uh, made uh, to happen. They see... Uh, little uh, boys and girls being told that they're not boys and girls and they're of an opposite sex. They're seeing teenage girls cut off their breasts and take tablets uh, so that uh, they change sexes and have sex changes. They see all sorts of laws in the Bible being flaunted, but most of all, things are getting hard and tough for Christians to live. They're getting threatened and upset and uh, their world isn't as enjoyable as it is. So most uh, Christians just want to escape. They just want to um, get the pain over. They just want to go. Uh, what uh, most Christians will be surprised is uh, in is that uh, most of them don't walk in the Holy Spirit, aren't led by the Holy Spirit. And according to Romans, they're not a son of God and only... Only the sons of God uh, are going to be taken in a pre-tribulation rapture. And so um, uh, people don't know that. Uh, I know that you know all these things and you're aware of all these things, but people don't know that. So even their hope of a rapture isn't going to save them from the trouble. Thank you. Thank you, God. I think the sad thing for me in what you've said there is the broken addict don't find peace in the church, so they are not necessarily in the church. 
But and the, uh, those people that church meant to be for, it's meant to be for the broken hearted. It's meant to be for people that really want to feel the love of God. So how do you feel about that if the church doesn't really cater for the broken hearted today, but only caters for the perfect people based on what they define as being perfect? It, it really uh, breaks the heart of my son. Uh, you, you know, my son uh, used to, when he wanted to let his hair down, when he wanted to relax, he used to go and sit at a seat with sinners at it, like the prostitutes, uh, the tax collectors. A lot of people don't understand what a tax collector is. It's like saying a politician, sitting down with a politician, someone who's a sellout, someone who doesn't do politics because he's got a good heart. He does it for the money and the power and the control, but it's got wrong motives. Uh, the modern people haven't got tax collectors. You've got a tax department. Uh, but uh, so it'd be like a, a politician or a bureaucrat. Uh, that Jesus used to sit down with sinners and he used to have good fun. And uh, Matthew finds uh, great fun uh, uh, speaking to people who say they believe in God and they pray to me every night, but they just don't believe that they need to go to church. And Matthew loves those sort of people. He can tell them stories about interviewing saints and meeting Jesus and meeting angels and conversing with a witch that spends time with him and and uh, they lap it up and uh, but the Christian church uh, is full of Christians with doctrine and and verses and meanings of verses that they believe are true and uh, one verse is don't forsake the gathering of the brethren, which they've got a misunderstanding of that verse. And uh, they understand that verse out of the context that was in. And so they use that verse as a sword, as a weapon for people who who don't attend church. And they quote that verse, at it, but it's totally out of context. The early church used to meet six days a week and uh, they'd spend about five hours each afternoon and night time at church and it was constantly in revival and uh, that verse was saying don't stop this mm. meeting six days a week don't stop this revival continue doing that don't forsake the gathering of the brethren and churches did that 2000 years ago so it should never be used as a verse with an individual that's hurt or been broken uh, by a Christian and has been offended and won't hang around Christians anymore. It should never be used for them and never be quoted to them because that's not the meaning of the verse. The, the church already forsake, forsaked the gathering of the brethren. And to be honest with you, if most of you really understood the meaning of that verse, you'd stop going to church too. So church should be a sanctuary. It should be a place. It should be a healing place. But if you want comfort, you'll find comfort in a pub or in a brothel or in a gambling institution, places where people are sinning at the races, at the beach, at the football, at, at sports. Uh, That's where non-Christians, people who believe in me but don't go to your church, that's where they hang out and spend time and they find no joy in going to a church where they're judged and ask rude questions and judge with, uh, with the answers that they give. And Christians are so full of Bible verses, quoting Bible verses, but they don't use them to encourage. They use them as swords and cut people and... Uh, the non-Christians, what you call non-Christians, just don't enjoy being hurt. So it really breaks my heart, and uh, that's why I need the servants uh, to go out in the highways and byways. They're not going to be bringing them into churches. only going to be like 10% of churches that will be used in the last day's harvest Um but uh, they're going to be fellowshipping with them in their places of sin, in their places of recreation. And uh, that's why uh, Matthew is uh, so important. And uh, he's five books on evangelism, um, 
one of his books is Influencing Your World for Christ. And if you look up that book, Influencing Your World for Christ, you'll see it's uh, one of five books in a series on Amazon. And that's why he wrote five books about evangelism, because it took more than one book and many facets. Uh, but uh, people like Matthew is one of these servants that uh, the glory of God has been on, seen on him uh, three times that he recollects where everyone was reacting and his face was shining. Uh, he's one of the servants that's going to collect the harvest, but not many of you are qualified. So it breaks my heart, but I've got to have to send the servants out of the church into the highways and the byways to collect my harvest. Thank you, God. Still on number one, Matthew. So for people that are brokenhearted, but they were able to make it to heaven, do they still feel the same in heaven or are they more accepted? Do they still feel a sense of rejection from the ones that think they are religious or it, it, it differ? Religion gets stripped off people in heaven. Uh, in heaven, you very quickly find out where your doctrine was wrong and where you're out of line and what different uh, doctrinal errors you believed in. Matthew's mum uh, believed in the hypergrace doctrine. She believed in once saved, always saved, that uh, you can't lose your salvation. She believed a heresy that said, if uh, you say a one paragraph sinner's prayer, that once you pray that, there's nothing you can do, you're going to go to heaven. There's nothing you can do wrong. Matthew used to say, you've got to obey, you've got to obey, you've got to be holy. There's there's consequences. If you don't do it, you won't go to heaven. Matthew, Matthew's mum used to argue with him. She was so convinced with this hypergrace doctrine that you can't lose your salvation. She was only two weeks in heaven and Matthew was talking to her and she was repenting to Matthew and saying, sorry, you were right all the time. And she was saying sorry about her belief in the uh, in, in uh, the end times differently to how Matthew believed. Matthew believed that most of the Christians were going to go through the tribulation. His mother was convinced uh, from uh, from uh, preachers who had churches with fifty thousand people in it, um, John Haggai and people like that. Uh, she was convinced of a pre-tribulation rapture. And, all the Christians, once saved, always saved, every Christian uh, was going to go to heaven in that rapture. And only the people who didn't believe um, that uh, Christians call those people who don't go to church, those non-believers, uh, only they would be left behind. And they'd start going to church and commit their lives and go halfway through the tribulation, but they'd have to go through the tribulation and Matthew was always arguing with her, saying, no, no, mm. you've got to be obedient. You've got to be following Jesus. Most of the Christians are going to be left behind, she'd argue. So she was arguing over the once saved, always saved, hyper-grace doctrine. Matthew was more legalistic. Um, she was arguing over uh, the pre-tribulation rapture where Matthew believed most of the Christians were going to go through the tribulation. There were so many points that she argued with Matthew over. And because Matthew is mentally ill, she just believed it was Matthew's mental illness. Whenever Matthew got a revelation, she thought that was Satan giving him the revelation and a demon, not the Holy Spirit. And because she had teachers that were great teachers with large followings and selling millions of copies of books about red moons and stuff, John Haggai got a couple of books on the red moon and what that meant and all those prophecies didn't come true. Just because she followed these great teachers, she didn't believe this overweight, obese, mentally ill son of hers that didn't have a job for 20 years uh, he couldn't possibly be hearing from the Holy Spirit. But within two weeks, she was in tears talking to him from heaven, repenting and saying sorry that she was so wrong. And so um, it only took her two weeks. She she believed that for 30 years. And Matthew had some uh, great arguments with her and uh, 
and uh, within two weeks she'd been transformed. So heaven will have a real good way of washing the religion out of people and the broken-hearted people will be refreshed and some of the broken-hearted people will go into some of the highest realms in heaven because uh, Jesus said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Uh, if anyone wants to be a great uh, he must be a servant of all. And you'll find that the brokenhearted people are really compassionate, really kind. They'll give you the jacket off their back. They'll give you mm. a spare jacket. They'll get home and get you a spare jacket. Like John the Baptist said, if you've got two coats and your brother hasn't got one, give him a coat. And the brokenhearted will take you to their house and give you a jacket if you're homeless or take the jacket off their back if you're shivering on the streets and you're both homeless. Matthew remembers a story about this businessman that was going through a hard time and he came out of uh, this uh, multi-storey building and sat down on the pavement and it was winter. He started to shiver and a homeless man walked up uh, with with a blanket and said, I'm used to the weather more, mate, but if you're going to be staying out of here tonight, if you're sleeping rough tonight, here's my blanket. He said, uh, uh, no, I'm just sad and I, I'm crying. I'm overwhelmed with something. I'm under a lot of pressure, but I've got a home to go to. He said, what are you giving me a blanket for? Where are you sleeping? He said, over here. And he said, do you sleep here? Haven't you got a house? And he mm -hmm. said, no. And um, that uh, businessman started a ministry uh, that fed 150 guys a night with uh, like restaurant quality food. And he started a whole ministry uh, mm -hmm. feeding the homeless because of that altercation. That's what the homeless are like. They're so beaten down and so broken that they've suffered so much that they can't stand anyone's suffering. They, they've been through so much pain that they've got so much ca compassion and empathy. And some of the brokenhearted people are going to be in the highest positions in heaven, just like Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And anyone who wants to be great may be a servant of all. And some uh, sexually abused women, obese women, uh, are like, some of the most beautiful women you'll ever meet. If you could just get over the fact that you want a slim or attractive woman, if you could just accept a fat woman, you wouldn't find a more compassionate, loving uh, woman than a sexually abused woman. And uh, she'll do anything and she'll last, lend her last $20. She'll give her last $20 uh, to a friend who can't pay a power bill and she'll eat canned food for three days because uh, she hasn't got any money because she gave the rest of her money. And they'll do that. They'll eat canned food for three days to help out their friend. But a rich person, a good buttoned up Christian with nice clothes and nice cars and nice houses and nice Gucci handbags, they won't give the last $20 uh, away. They, they won't ever have a bank balance that's only got $20. They've always got thousands of dollars. And so, um, yeah, the brokenhearted will uh, be accepted and loved and revered and uh, like uh, the little boy that had two fish and five loaves, uh, a lot of brokenhearted people have done some amazing things. Prostitutes, prostitutes are some of the most beautiful women, and Matthew knows that from a long addiction to prostitutes. They're some of the greatest women, and they they make so many men feel good. They make so many men comforted, and so many men cry in their arms and get soothed by them. They're like counsellors. They're the best friend and they're really understanding and compassionate. So many of them will be in exalted positions in heaven. And um, people uh, who used to look down on, on that whore, they call them, uh, will find that whore is bossing them around in heaven and they've got an answer to the prostitute. So we've got a way of justice in heaven and... Um, and I'll tell you one other thing that 
a, a large portion of suicide victims end up in heaven, and that's a Catholic uh, heresy that uh, suicide will take you to hell. And if you're in a stage where you believe in me and you love Jesus and you've got a faith in me and you've had too much, don't be afraid mm. to kill yourself because it says in the Bible that uh, when a person's born, their days are written in a book. If it's right. your time to go, it's your time to go. And um, God knows, I, I know the number of days that you're meant to live. So don't be afraid of that heresy that says you won't come to heaven. Welcome home. Thank you, God. That just shows another dimension of you, God, that you're such a loving father. Well, Christianity or religion doesn't allow us to see that beautiful part, but we only see the judgmental part of you. So speaking about suicide in that way is really beautiful because I know a lot of people are fine either their family in that situation and they're sad for them. My next question is, they say no one knows the day, nor the hour. Where, where does that phrase come from? So uh, Matthew was at a conference one time where a prophet that he really respects, uh, Bruce Allen, uh, and Bruce Allen's got some good books. Uh, he's a good friend of Michael Van Vlyman, and uh, Michael Van Vlyman ministers with him. Bruce Allen did a teaching that uh, there's a certain feast uh, in Israel that gets celebrated, and um, they celebrate it on the new moon. And um, apparently at that time of the year, the moon appears one of two days, and they don't know the day, whether it's a Monday or Tuesday, they know it's going to either be on a Monday or Tuesday, and they don't know the hour on that day that it's going to appear. But when it does appear, a watchman goes to a certain place and they blow a trumpet, and that starts the celebrations and the feast of the new moon. Matthew thinks, and I use Matthew's intellect, Matthew thinks that uh, feast is the feast of trumpets, but um, but uh, that's what Jesus was referring to when he said, no one knows the day nor the hour. He was saying, I'm going to return on the feast of trumpets, and I'm going to return on the new moon, and an archangel will sound, an angel, uh, sound a trumpet, and I'll return. So it's not about Jesus, the Son of God, part of the Trinity, having no idea when he's going to come back. It's not hmm. about Jesus having no idea when he's going to rapture the church. In fact, the rapture is getting pushed back depending on how disobedient the church is. That hmm. The current church is delaying the rapture it's going back and the more disobedient the church is the more blind the church is the more dead the church is the more awake asleep the church is the further the rapture goes back because we've got to raise up the sons of god and bring in the harvest and until the sons of god have been fully trained and raised up the harvest can't so the last thing's going to happen is the people are going to be collected on the highways and byways, but the sons of God have got to be risen up. So we do know the day and we do know the hour, but like I said in question one, those three prophetic signs have to happen before you can see any rapture. Thank you, God. Matthew, have you got anything to say? Uh, I just want to uh, uh, congratulate you on uh, your idea through to Lou about uh, doing an interview uh, with um, with uh, you us doing an interview with you. Um, it, it really uh, triggered me today when the woman was asking me a question about uh, the red heifer, and uh, we know that that Israel has got all the implements and 
got all the materials and the equipment uh, to serve in the temple. They just need a temple. And uh, uh, it's uh, very poignant that Israel is in a war at the moment. And uh, all the revelation experts think that that is a sign. Um, and uh, so, Matt, I, I don't listen I don't listen to people who preach on revelation. Uh, so uh, I stay away from it, but uh, I'm really happy uh, that uh, that uh, you um, inspired us to do this interview. Uh, so so God says, um, I'm really happy that you're doing the interview. I'm really enjoying the interview. And um, uh, when you spent uh, 16 years studying the book of Revelation, uh, you learned so much and you understood so much. And because you're manic depressive, you've got the mind of a genius and you, you looked at all the prophetic scriptures and worked out uh, what the two witnesses are going to do, were going to do in the book of Revelation. And when you read all the books and all the articles on the two witnesses, you realize that none of the experts knew anything about the two witnesses. They couldn't even identify who they are. And uh, you realize that if uh, these are the experts on the book of Revelation, and this is what they know about Revelation chapter 11, well, they mustn't know much about the other chapters either. And what you realize from your 16 years study of the prophet, that uh, people who are experts on the book of Revelation really have no idea. And uh, so I'm pleased to be talking to you again and discussing this. And I hope uh, uh, my answers are enlightening to people who are reading this book. Thank you, God. I guess the sad thing is to know that the current church is the one delaying the rapture. And those current church will probably not be interested in watching this video or probably reading the book because they don't believe it's actually coming from God. So it's really, really sad to know that our actions are contributing to the delaying of your coming. And I hope they are more open-minded to be able to read this book and believe in whatever is being said today. My next question is number three. If well, I'll, were... I'll respond to that. Um, Jesus had a parable about uh, servants uh, serving him, and the master was being delayed, so they started to beat the other servants and act up and start drinking, misbehaving, and beating uh, servants up. And it wasn't a good end for those servants. Well, those servants that were waiting on a delay and started drinking and started acting out, that's the current church. Wow. And uh, that's that's the parable about the current church that you live in. They beat up the brokenhearted. The brokenhearted are desperate and want to touch, just one touch of the glory, one touch of the presence. They just want to come into a house of God and they get rejected and stabbed. Matthew knows because he's just one of the brokenhearted. He he used to go to a church that he really loved, and he found that when he was walking home from that church each week, he was sadder than he was when he arrived, that his attendance in the church actually made him sadder. And as a bipolar with manic depressive, he, he lived with a lot of depression, and even if he was depressed, yet you'd think that going to church would make you happier. But he found uh, there was two sorts of people in the church, the, the broken-hearted homeless people that came for a free meal and the people with jobs and the normal Christians. And the normal Christians wouldn't talk to him. And uh, the rejection of the normal Christians um, used to make him sad to, He's only friends that he could have in the church. The only people that would speak to him for half an hour were the homeless. And uh, Matthew had a job and felt that it, he, his mental illness wasn't a bad thing. But when he tried to engage with Christians that had a normal job, they didn't want to be his friend. And he used to go home sadder. And the brokenhearted just try that for a week or 
a few months or a year and then they walk away sad saying this isn't happening this is making me feel rejected and judged and not understood and um and so they walk away from church and uh they get really sad well um matthew's heard prophecies about stadium revivals and stadiums being filled with with christians and this great outpouring and this great revival and stuff uh, but he wrote a book uh, called why revival tarries and it was a story about how the church had to totally be changed uh, to bring in a revival and and why the great outpouring the great prophesied revival is tarrying and isn't happening because the current church isn't ready to receive the harvest and steward the harvest and and mentor and disciple the brokenhearted and they've got no desire to they don't want the brokenhearted in their church and they make it very clear even to a person that can express himself like Matthew and write 120 books, that's not good enough for the Christians mm -hmm. to to accept him. And uh, so, um, so I wanted to comment on that. So, thank you, God. My next question, number three, is: If people were going to focus on something, should they be focusing on the rapture or focusing on the teachings of Jesus? So if I was to say to you that Jesus is definitely not going to return in the next 30 years, mm. there's going to be no pre-tribulation rapture in the next 30 years. And if the world gets worse and worse and there comes some suffering, you're just going to have to cope with it. Mm. If there's another coronavirus part two, coronavirus part three, as the elites invent uh, diseases and put them into the population like they did with coronavirus, mm. how are you going to survive it? In Matthew 7, Jesus said, anyone that heeds these sayings of mine and puts them into practice, he'll be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the storms came and beat on the house, his house stood because it was founded on the rock. Then he said, and if anyone hears these sayings of mine and doesn't obey them, he'd be like the foolish man building his house upon the sand. And when the storms came and beat on the house, that house fell and mighty was the fall. There's a major teaching error, and Matthew heard this from a famous teacher just last week, that says that because Peter called Jesus the Messiah, Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my house and the gates of hell won't come against it. And people assume that that rock is the confession that Jesus is the Messiah. So when Jesus said these people build their house upon the rock, they believe that believing in Jesus and saying a one-paragraph sinner's prayer one day is means that their house is founded on the rock because they believe in Jesus and everything's going to be okay. And if the storms come, they're okay because they're anointed and protected by God. But they miss out the fact that it's the Holy Spirit that interprets Scripture. And when Jesus was saying these sayings of mine, he was talking about obeying his 54 parables and his 50 commandments. Or you could line up a hundred Christians and ask them all, how many commandments did Jesus have? And 98 of 100, if 98 answered, would say, love God with all your heart, mind and soul and love your neighbour as your soul. There would only be one or two that would be able to say, oh, Jesus had many. Uh, maybe one might say Jesus had 50. 
But how could you be obeying 50 commandments when you don't even know what they are? And mm -hmm. there's another thing that's highly disturbing is Matthew doesn't know one other Christian in the world that understands what the 54 parables mean. And if you don't understand what they mean, how can you be obeying them? Well, it's very scary because there's hard times coming and there's a storm coming. And these sayings of mine are the meanings of the 50 commandments and the meanings of the 54 parables and obeying them and putting them into practice. So that makes 99% of the church not obeying the teachings of Jesus, not obeying the sayings of Jesus, because they don't understand. They First of all, they don't know the 50 commandments, and second of all, they don't understand what the 54 parables mean. So the sad thing is that the church is so blind, being led by blind guides, that they actually believe they're obeying Jesus. They actually believe they're holy. They believe they're sanct sanctified. They believe they're set apart. They believe they've got a good relationship with Jesus. They believe they're protected by God. And they don't believe anything will happen to them if there's a storm. Was it true that Christians didn't get coronavirus? Was it true that Christian businesses weren't closed down in coronavirus? Was it true that Christians weren't affected? Was was there any Christian town or Christian city in America that wasn't affected by coronavirus? Did did the protection of being a Christian actually protect you from that virus? Well, you'd think listening to Christians that that's what happened, but it didn't happen. The whole world was affected by that. And I can tell you over the next 30 years, things are going to get really bad and storms are going to come and things are going to wipe out. And like it says in that book, what like it says in Matthew 7, the house is going to fall and mighty will be the fall. Well, I can tell you the people that believe in God, that act on their conscience, that act on their instinct and don't act according to preconceived verses, they do a better job of obeying Jesus than the church who's religious and blind. So when the storms come, many of those people will be laughing at the Christians and be happy that the Christians' house fell. Mm -hmm. To have many Christians, it's very hard to get yourself out of the habit, but many Christians are so condescending of everyone else. They think they're better than everyone. And so there'll be a great celebration when the churches start to fall and the Christians start to scatter and they lose everything. There'll be a great thing. And and so in in a long answer. My uh, answer is you shouldn't be worried about the rapture. You should be worried about the storms that are coming over the next 30 years. And you should learn what the 50 commandments say and learn to obey them. And you should learn what the 54 parables mean and learn to obey them. And if you look up uh, two books called The Narrow Way, um, uh, it, it on... Uh, Amazon under Matthew's uh, name, then uh, you'll find he's got a comprehensive book on the parables and a comprehensive book on the commandments. And uh, you can read those books and learn to apply them and buy some insurance because mm -hmm. you're like going into the next 30 years with no insurance. And I can guarantee 99% of you have built your house upon the sand. And so if if you think things are bad, things are going to get really bad, and I, I wouldn't be focusing on some rapture that's coming in 30 years' time. I'd be focusing on buying some insurance. But currently, your houses are not insured. Hmm. 
powerful. Currently, your house is not insured. Matthew, do you have anything to say before my comment? I I just want to um I always just want to commend you, uh, God, for bringing such a answer. I I, I don't necessarily agree with Tolu where she says that the Christians aren't going to read this book. There's there's going to be a number of Christians, maybe five or ten Christians, who read this book and get profoundly affected and go and study the commandments and study the parables and implement them in their life. Uh, they, they may be Christians that by influencing your world for Christ and by the other five books, learn how to be a beautiful Christian that doesn't judge or condemn people. They may, may actually go and buy a book on how to walk in the Holy Spirit that uh, I'm going to uh, produce in the next few months and they may actually start to read all my books. They may start to get educated on the true gospel of Christ and read a hundred of my books, spend a hundred dollars and start reading and applying. So I'm so happy that there will be some people, even if it's just one person, it's worth spending a thousand dollars for that person. So I'm so happy uh, that you're able to use my intellect and my knowledge and uh, you can uh, speak through me and speak the message that you want to speak in this day. I'm so happy. And God says, uh, I'm really pleased that we're doing this interview and I'm really enjoying myself. Thank you, God. Yeah, Matthew, the reason why I say Christians might not read it is because majority of the time, they're not interested. I've told people that are close to me, like that I know about these books, about these videos, and a lot of times they're just not interested like you want them to be interested. But you said something that one person might be interested and we might be doing this just because of that one person. But from God's response now, I'm thinking the 54 parables and the 50 commandments are things that are not heard of in the church. Like every message I've heard in the past is very rare before somebody teaches on any of those parables. So people are not aware that there are parables that they're supposed to be following or commandments that they need to adhere to. So I think the level of ignorance in, in the Christendom is very, very sad. And I hope more people are able to hear from you, God, and learn and know that the importance of their Christian journey is to be able to idea to what Jesus has preached in his commandments and in these parables that we are currently finalizing another book on. So that's why I wanted to add to your response, God. And my next question, which is number four, is what's more important First to you? First of all, God wants to say, um, I really appreciate uh, your time. I really appreciate the effort. Uh, I really appreciate uh, how you've been used to uh, do the playlist on YouTube called Mentoring in the Heavenlies. Um, I'm really excited how uh, the playlist of videos of saints has uh, started to transform your life and disciple you. Uh, before uh, you met Matthew, you didn't really know about the meanings of the 54 parables. And even though you've edited the book on the 54 parables, you still don't understand them. You still know you've got to read the book 10 times to apply them and get them working in your life. You said something very interesting when you're doing the parables and uh, you summed it up and you said that they're all about love. It's all different ways of loving. And uh, that was really profound because John, uh, called uh, the disciple of love, said in 1 John, Matthew doesn't know uh, the uh, verse, uh, uh, God is love. And that's who I am. I'm a God of love. And, you know, um, a person uh, who wants to sell lettuce or grow lettuce in the United States there's a 500-page document of regulations of mm. what you've got to do to grow letters to the standard of the American uh, system. And 
it's 500 pages. It's about lettuce. And the Christian life is about imitating Jesus and demonstrating Jesus' character in the world and changing the world. And people won't read a 500-page book on what Jesus' teachings are. They, they don't want to even bother. Matthew asked me some months ago, why do the Christians uh, read about the parables of Jesus and the commandments of Jesus? Why don't they study it so they can do it? And I replied to him, made him really upset and sent him into like a mini depression. My answer was they don't research the parables and the commandments because they know if they understand what they mean, that they're going to have to do it and they'll be accountable. So they just play religion and put their head in the sand. And that's how it is. If you're reading this book and you don't go and buy those books and uh, you don't uh, take all the recommendations of the books that will be mentioned in this book, that's on you. Mm. You know, uh, Matthew used to argue with his mum, who are these people uh, who who come to Jesus in Matthew 7 and say, Lord, Lord, and I said, depart from me, I never knew you. And they say, but we did signs and wonders and miracles and healed people and prophesied and mm. said, depart from me, you practice lawlessness. He begged his mum for, for 10 years. Who are these people? They're prophesying, they're healing. They've got to be Christians. And his mum didn't have an answer, like they must be non-Christians doing false signs and wonders. So they're definitely Christians. You can't prophesy without Jesus. You can't do miracles without Jesus. And if you try and cast out demons without Jesus, they'll beat you up, like it said in Acts. And she was so convinced, once saved, always saved, that no one could go to hell, that she used to argue. He had an argument a week before her death, or a couple of weeks before her death, she said, don't ring me anymore. He used to ring her every day for 20 years. And she broke fellowship with him over that verse because he finally found a verse that said people who follow the prosperity doctrine are, are workers of miracles that are in this position. And if you're in love with the world, uh, you'll be in this position. And he rang up to share that he'd found a book and found the answer, but it was against her doctrine of once saved, always saved. So they had a massive argument. And this is the fact that he searched for 10 years what's the meaning of this, and the Holy Spirit finally allowed him. The Holy Spirit built tension up in him for 10 years. Mm and finally allowed him to know the answer. And yet people don't want to know the answer. They they think that they're a Christian, they're saved, they said the sinner's prayer, they go to church, they study, but they don't even know that they're the tares. There's weed and tares, and they're the tares, and they've got no fruit. And the difference between wheat and tares is at the harvest, the wheat has got fruit, and at the harvest, tares have got no fruit. That's the only way you can tell the difference. And the people in the Christian church don't realize that they're tares. They've got no fruit. They're not obeying Jesus. They haven't got the good works of the kingdom. So they're going to get the works. They're going to have to depart from Jesus. And he's going to say, I never knew you. And there's so many of you reading this book that can't be bothered going and reading the resources. And I, I'm just telling you clearly, you've been warned today, take mm -hmm. action. And over the next 30 years, you may uh, experience a tribulation and you may come back to this book and say, what were the names of this book? I've got to get my act together. Uh, so I pray, well, I don't have to pray. I'll I'll have uh, angels intercede for you that... Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, are convicted by this message and you go on and do something about this message. Because like I said to Matthew, most Christians don't want to know about these things because they don't want to do anything. So be different. Be the one that we wrote this book for. Thank you, God. 
And thank you for the feedback. Yes, I didn't know about all of these parables or commandments, even though I might have heard about them before, but I never thought it's a way of living. It's telling you how Jesus expects you to live until I met Matthew and we started discussing. So I've known so much in the past nine months that we've known each other and interviewing the saints as well. But what you've just said now, God, about this verse, Lord, Lord, depart from me, who are these people, is actually a book in itself. So maybe Matthew will get inspiration to write something about this topic so that Christians can know that this Bible verse is for them. It's for the older son in that parable of the son that returned. It wasn't for the younger one. It's talking to the people that are already in the fold. It's talking about the 99 shapes. So I think this is what we Christians, we just need to get that realization that we are actually in the wrong path and the earlier, the better we come and follow God and go the right direction. So thank you, God, for shedding more light on things like this. And I hope people are blessed as they watch this later on. So my number four question, God, is what's more important to you? church service prayer, or walking and being led by the Holy Spirit? Okay, so, so many people uh, like a checklist. They they like books that say six tips to intimacy with Jesus or six steps to financial abundance or uh, seven rules for financial success or 15 successful habits uh, that you can uh, become a success. They like one, two, three, four, five. They, they like someone to do all the work for them. So there's an established false teaching, religious teaching in the church, that if you want to get close to God, you need to read your Bible, go to church, pray, give to God, and don't ever stop going to church. So that's religion. They're religious things. They're steps. And you go to any preacher and ask him how to become intimate with Jesus or or, or live the proper Christian life, you'll, you'll see those four or five things said. You need to pray. You need to read your Bible every day. You, mm. you need to go to church. You need to fellowship with Christians. You need to give. And it's easy because it's a formula, but it becomes religion. So uh, let's just say that you you wake up. So when do you pray and when do you read your Bible? Well, I'm a morning person, so I'll do it in the morning. So they read their Bible for 15 minutes a Bible that they can't understand, that they've got no revelation on. They spend five minutes praying, but they push themselves to 15 minutes. Bored, bored with the prayer, but stretching it on because they have to. So they've spent half an hour with God in the morning, and that's it. They've spent 15 minutes reading scripture that they don't understand. Because that's what you do to get close to God. You don't get close to me reading scripture that you don't understand. That's just a waste of time. That just gives you verses that you can throw at other Christians and judge other people. That gives you a knowledge of the word of God, but no wisdom of the word of God. You didn't know, don't forsake the gathering of the brethren. That's the verse that you know that you quoted every broken-hearted person who refuses to go to your synagogue of Satan. You, you throw that as a knife. You run that through people as a judgment. But you don't even have revelation on what that verse means. And every one of you Christians have got verses that are totally misunderstood, mistranslated, mis misapplied, and you're running around with hundreds of verses that are error. You only learn what Scripture says by the indwelling Holy Spirit. 
you, you're better to spend 15 minutes in intercession or worship. That's one of the things we missed out. You need to worship. You're you better to spend the first 15 minutes of your devotion time listening to some worship or praying to the Holy Spirit that he would give you some insight into the scripture that day. Then you read for 15 minutes and one verse really jumps out at you and suddenly you're getting understanding what that verse actually means. It may be like one verse out of a whole page of scripture, but you know that you know that you know what that verse means now. There you go. That's meditating on the word of God. Now, you, you not only you not only get that seed, daily bread, give, give us today your daily bread. You not only get that daily bread, but you can go and share that with your good natured friends this week at church. Do you know what Jesus told? Do you know what the Holy Spirit said? This verse told me what it means. It doesn't mean this, it means this. You'll find very quickly, if you start doing that, you'll lose all your Christian friends. Mm. Because you'll start coming out with meanings of verses that disagree with them. And they'll start calling you mentally ill or deceived or false or whatever. So it might get very lonely if you understand scripture, but there's no use reading scripture if you're not going to understand it. And I can tell you I'm God, right? And many Christians don't understand scripture. They can quote a lot of scripture, but they don't live scripture. It's better that you only know five verses and live them than 500 verses and not live any of them. So if you read 15 minutes a day, you'll hear that someone else reads 100 uh, like for an hour a day. Then you'll feel bad. And if you pray 15 minutes a day and you hear that someone else prays two hours a day in tongues and you haven't got the gift of tongues, you'll feel bad. If, if you go to church once a week because you're busy and someone else goes to church three times a week, you feel bad. Whatever you do that's religious, that's one of the rules, one of the steps to becoming close to me. Whatever you do, no matter what you do, there's always someone doing better and more, and you're always feeling guilty. You're always feeling like you don't measure up. You read the boring Bible because you have to. You don't want to do it. You pray a boring prayer because you have to and you don't want to do it. And you think you're impressing me and you think you're getting close to me. You're thinking that's the formula. And that's the formula that so many Christians are on. They wonder why they don't know me. Now, what's that compared to knowing the 50 commandments of Jesus, knowing the 54 parables of Jesus and how to apply them? And every single thought that comes into your mind you weigh that thought against all that Jesus taught. So someone calls you a bad name at work and causes you to be embarrassed in front of a few people. You go off to her, their friends and you get the thought, I'll just go to all their friends and say what they said to me and say what a jerk they are. Well, that's a revenge. That's a common flesh reaction. So that's what you do. But if you take every thought captive, Jesus says, turn the other cheek, forgive 490 times, bless your brother, pray for your brother, do good for your brother, um, bless your enemy, pray for your enemy, do good for your enemy. If your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. There's six or seven things you can do for them. And none of them include gossiping and speaking bad about them. That's what taking every thought captive is. If you take every thought and compare it to scripture, you'll find it's hard to obey the scripture. You'll find you'll be calling on the power of the Holy Spirit to enable you 
to give you the courage to obey the word of God. But the more you do it, the more you take thoughts captive and you get a lot of wrong thoughts in a day, the more you start obeying scripture, the more yourself aligning yourself, aligning with the ways of God, you start to walk in the Holy Spirit. You start to constantly be calling on the power of the Holy Spirit and you're getting through each day through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the more you interact with the Holy Spirit, the more he'll come into your scripture reading and you'll have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Suddenly you'll be reading scriptures and you'll be seeing that's another commandment of Jesus. That's another one. That's what he says to do here. You'll get wisdom. And slowly over time, you'll be able to speak to the Holy Spirit, be led by the Holy Spirit each day, be directed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help you with your worship. The Holy Spirit will help you get meaning out of what your pastors say when you're at church. The Holy Spirit will help you with your prayer life. The Holy Spirit will give you words when you haven't got words. The Holy Spirit will do everything. So your religion will be a whole lot better if you built intimacy with Jesus. And religion will just take you to hell. Religion will just have you feeling bad all the time and feeling like you don't measure up. And do you measure up? Do you measure up? Do you think you measure up? Well, Matthew measures up. He's in a great condition. Even five minutes after sleeping with a prostitute, he measures up, right? He He's so close to us. He loves us so much. One time Matthew had slept with a prostitute. He was walking away. He's feeling bad. And for mm -hmm. five minutes, he was working on himself. And he saw a young Chinese girl, about six, uh, at the station. It, or the brothel was five minutes from the station. He saw this young Chinese girl. And he said to himself as a thought, she's so innocent. She's so sweet. She's so innocent. And Jesus said to Matthew, that's who you are to us. Right in the midst of him feeling bad, he'd already processed the fact that he'd sinned. He'd already got his relationship back. So it hadn't taken five minutes for him to dispense with the guilt and the condemnation. He's back on the right level. He said in, to himself, Jesus is sweet and innocent. And Jesus said to him, that's who you are to us. What was he saying? <laughs> that's heresy. Here's a known prophet has just slept with a prostitute. And Jesus is saying, you're sweet and innocent to us. So what's true? Is, is that something false is that a false jesus speaking to him is that a demon does that line up with your theology or well, it lines up with matthew's intimacy with us it lines up with his ability to hear jesus voice it lines up as a sheep he's one of the lost sheep he's not the 99 sheep he's the lost sheep and he's still finding his way back but he's being carried on his shepherd's Around his shepherd's neck, he's very close and intimate. He's still that lost sheep. He still hasn't got friends among the Christians. He still isn't righteous. And when he comes out with stories like that, 100% of Christians reject him. That wasn't Jesus who said you're sweet and innocent. So how do you feel about it? So no matter what you do in religion, it's never good enough. You're going to have to find your sufficiency in your identity with Christ, and you're going to have to find your sufficiency in your relationship with Christ, and you have to find your way to live and the directions that you take from the leading of the Holy Spirit. So, of course, in a really long answer, it's so much more beneficial for you to have intimacy with the Holy Spirit than practice the tenets of religion. Thank you, God. We need the long answers because the long answers helps us to understand it better. So I like the way you go and then come back to the question and answer the question. So thank you for that detailed response. Matthew, have you got anything to say? I, I really uh, 
sometimes, God, I, I, I really wish uh, you and the Holy Spirit wouldn't just stories, you know, like my my brother used to say to me, why do you mention in all your books that you sleep with prostitutes? And I haven't touched wood. I, 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 I haven't done it for three months and I'm sort of feeling like I'm over it. But um, uh, And I answer my brother because the Holy Spirit makes me do it. The Holy Spirit makes me say it. And I guess it makes people feel good, like, well, I'm better than him. He sleeps with prostitutes and he's got a porn addiction. If if he's got that and he's so close to God, well, what chance have I got? I, I'm not I'm doing not doing those things. I've got a better chance of being closer to God. So um I really appreciate uh how you lead me through the power of the Holy Spirit to uh share testimonies that make such a difference. You know. Five minutes talking to you is just better than a one-hour, one-way prayer to you. I, I used to get so bored praying prayers that the only time I pray one-way prayers is when I'm praying for someone else. I, I don't ask for things. I don't ask you for anything. I, I've actually been rebuked by the Holy Spirit that I never ask for anything and I, I said, you, you supply all your my needs according to your riches and glory. And the Holy Spirit replied, yeah, but we like to give you things and we can't give you things unless you ask. And um, so I really appreciate you, our God, for sticking with me through all these years. You know, um, yeah, Peter said, how, how many times shall we forgive? And uh, seven times, and Jesus says 70 times seven. But I think of how many prostitutes to sleep. I'm over 490. Like, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't like to put people off with this book reading saying I'm not going to accept anything from him sleeping with that many prostitutes. But I really reckon it, it was past 490 quite a few years ago. So um, thank you for being my God. And um, I think we're only going to go up to question 10 in this part, and this will be part one. Um, but I really appreciate you. I really love you. I really love the wisdom that you're pouring forth through me. Um, some of this I, I really know, um, but uh, it's a really good conversation. I, I wanted uh, to have a conversation with you today and not just, have questions like we question the saints. I want to tell you how much I love you and how, how much I appreciate you. And, you know, the Holy Spirit told me nine months ago that I was finished writing and uh, it hurt me because I'd been writing for 11 years. And now I'm writing again and it's like it's refresh, it's such a refreshment, it's such a joy. And I'm thanking you that uh, you give me so much and I'm so happy you bless me so much. So God says, uh, I really appreciate you too, mate. You're, you're the little boy with two fish and five loaves and we're just doing miracles together. And um, and just for Tulu while I'm talking, uh, you're never going to catch up with Matthew's rewards. You, well, I'll still give it a go, God. <laughs> Oh my God, I'll still go after Matthew. Either way. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so this is God. Um, I really appreciate you, Tulu, uh, and thanks for listening today. And we'll go on to question 10. Thank you, God. So, my next question, which is question five, is how does one learn how to walk in the Holy Spirit? So this is God speaking. This is uh, going to be uh, easy because I laid the framework uh, for most of this in a previous answer. But when when you learn all the commandments uh, in the New Testament, not only the commandments of Jesus, but the commandments in the epistle, epistles, like when you correct a person, do it with humility and love. 
right? That's Paul. Matthew's had 200 people on YouTube and in, in reviews on his book bring him correction, about 200. There was two of them that did it with humility and love. And he responded and repented. But the rest were given out of pride and self-righteousness. So you got to check yourself when you feel that you're going to correct someone on Facebook or you're going to correct someone on YouTube or you're going to correct someone in a public forum. You got to check yourself for humility and love. Matthew's very wise. He's read a hundred and twenty. He's written hundred and twenty-one books on the Christian faith. Besides Joyce Meyer, he doesn't know any other Christian that's written that many books on the Christian faith. He knows a lot. He's got a lot of theology. He's right about a lot of things, but he finds it very, very, very difficult to bring correction to people. Because he's most of the time puffed up with pride and self-righteousness when he thinks he has to. Matthew does most of his correction of people to strangers in books. But to actually write on someone's Facebook and bring him correction, you got to check yourself. Well, just just one thing that's said in the epistles. That, you know, be careful when when you try and correct a person because you may fall into the same sin, right? There is another verse that says something like that. That means don't be on the guy's case about his pornography because you might get addicted to pornography too. So that's another one. So there's there's a whole lot of commands in the epistles and there's the 50 commandments of Jesus, and there's the 54 parables of Jesus. So all of that scripture, now you can't take every thought captive if you don't know the scripture. If you're having a thought to do something like correct someone on Facebook or write a comment on this YouTube video, if you don't know the scripture, bring it in humility and love, you'll just act in the flesh and bring the correction. You won't take the thought captive that I'm going to correct. The Holy Spirit says, don't correct him unless you can do it through love and humility. Well, that wipes out 99% of people. Because if you're going to do it in love and humility, you'd write him a private message and you'd spend some time and you wouldn't be quoting scriptures at it. You'd be really like, I could be wrong about this, but... I really felt for 20 years that this verse means this, and I think that this verse means this, and I really apologise for saying this, but I think you need to read this verse and really meditate on it because I think that verse will really help. I had a real breakthrough with this verse, and for years I didn't believe it, but you need to believe it as what it's written, and I think that answers what you're saying. Uh, all the best. I've, I've written this because I love you and I used to once think uh, things like you. Um, uh, please know that I love you and I respect you and you can disregard this uh, and I apologise if I've offended you in any way. God bless. If you write something like that in a private message, you might get a private message back saying, thank you, I really appreciate that. I've changed my views. Thanks a lot. You might get a message back. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I can't receive that at the moment. Um, I, I don't think that is true, but I appreciate you writing to me. But if you post it in public in front of their friends, you're out of order. And if you think you got the right to do that because you're, you're correcting your friend because he's in error, you're doing it in front of his audience and his friend. That's like standing up in the middle of a sermon and correcting a pastor in front of his church. You're out of order. 
And if you ever think you need to do that, check yourself. And you can't check yourself if you don't know that verse. So if you know scripture, a lot of scripture, and you know the means of scripture, you haven't been having your 15-minute scripture reading, but you've been praying for 15 minutes and having the Holy Spirit reveal a scripture every day, you'll know a lot of scripture and you'll know the meanings of the scripture. And then if you use that scripture to decide what you do between moving in the way of the Holy Spirit or moving in the way of your flesh, then you'll become very adept at doing things God's way but doing things God's way is hard, right? But the Apostle John argues with that. He said the commands aren't burdensome. So uh, he, it is hard, but the Holy Spirit gives you the grace to do and obey. He, he tells you to obey, then he gives you the power to obey. So you learn to walk in the Holy Spirit by constantly every day 10 times a day if you're a male constantly getting erections and lusting after women at maybe 20 times a day uh just on the lust thing um but uh if if you're calling on the holy spirit 20 times a day you're starting to fellowship with the holy spirit and matthew's got a book called how to hear god's voice and you can learn how to speak speak to me and speak to Jesus and soon you'll learn to speak to the Holy Spirit and as you commune with the Holy Spirit each day taking every thought captive soon the Holy Spirit will start speaking to your spirit to start saying you really need to ring your mum this morning she she needs you to ring her this morning you've been on the phone for two hours to your girlfriend your mother's been trying to ring ring her she really needs you to ring and rather than just missing that you'll just have this inclination to actually ring your mum you really need to ring your mum so the first way the holy spirit speaks to you is through intuition uh, through an inkling but as you mature in the holy spirit the holy spirit will say those words to you your mother's been trying to ring you for two hours. Get off the phone and ring your mum. So that's a more intimate thing of the Holy Spirit. And so to be led by the Spirit is to be directed all day by the Holy Spirit. And uh, Matthew estimates that only 2% of the church actually do that. Matthew, every word I'm saying is being carried by the Holy Spirit. Matthew can speak for five hours under the unction of the Holy Spirit. It's just like it, it's me speaking, but it's just like the Holy Spirit has been speaking all this time. He's so in tune with the Holy Spirit, he can speak anything. And he can even allow me to speak about his sin. He's so empowered by the Holy Spirit, he'll just uh, say def self-deprecating things about himself just to make a point. And I'll say those things about him to make a point. And when you're led by the Spirit, uh, that's a wonderful thing. And uh, when you're led by the Spirit, the Isaiah 60 promise will come upon you and the glory of the Lord will rest upon you. Thank you, Bob. Matthew, have you got anything to say? No. Okay. So, God, I think what just makes me sad is that if people are actually led by the Holy Spirit, well, you said only 2% probably of Christians are led by the Holy Spirit. Why don't they know that Matthew's books or his videos are actually coming from God if they truly have the Holy Spirit in there? Well, the people who are led by the Holy Spirit probably like the videos and probably like the books and Matthew's I found out from certain people who've read nearly all his books and a heart, large portion of his books, and um, that's a good thing. Matthew gets directed all day uh, by the Holy Spirit, and everything he does seems to be led by the Holy Spirit. And even sometimes when he sins, good comes out of it. Uh, when not, the scripture says, 
uh, the Holy Spirit of God will never lead you into a sin, but you can be so close to God that even in the midst of sin, you're touching people's lives. Um, but before you're actually being led by the Holy Spirit, nearly every Christian, a lot of people that you don't call Christians that believe in God, are intuitively being led by the Holy Spirit and directed by the Holy Spirit. It's just a state of awareness when you're mm -hmm. actually aware that the Holy Spirit is leading you and and you're taking direction and you can recognise that that intuitive thought comes from the Holy Spirit and you need to obey it. Um, so many times in giving, the Holy Spirit will prompt you to give to that guest speaker, give them $50. You'll just get the idea, I'm going to give this person $50. You may think that was your thought, but you feel a peace and a grace to give that $50 and your wife looks at you and and she's $50, really? Give them 20 And you may say, no, it's 50 That was intuitively being led by the Holy Spirit. So I, I'm personally not saying, and Matthew's not saying that Christians can't be led by the Holy Spirit, but it's intuition. It's like a subconscious thing. Um, Non-Christians, uh, people who don't even believe in God, atheists, Elon Musk is led by the Holy Spirit. Donald Trump is being led by the Holy Spirit. Hillary Clinton is being led by the Jezebel spirit. No Holy Spirit for her. But nearly every Christian and nearly every person in the world can be led by the Holy Spirit. Hillary is so sold out to Satan that her only directions come from an evil source. But you have to be pretty evil to be in that place. Um, and uh, that may not be in the book. Um, but... Um, I uh, Biden uh, heard an interview uh, from a former uh, Democrat senator, and she said Biden was getting his directions of uh, Hillary and Obama, and Hillary was reported to say that she consults with the White House every day. Uh, so um, <laughs> we on we all sort of suspected that, but it was good to actually hear that. Um, so, um, but as for uh, staying up for two days and filling in uh, 24 hours or 48 hours of activity, activity after activity, one after another for 48 straight hours, that's being led by the Holy Spirit. It's not being intuitively suggested by the Holy Spirit. And there's not many Christians that could do that. And there's not many Christians who could actually speak on behalf of me about diff and answer questions like this. Uh, some prophets could do it, but a lot of prophets wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, so it takes a real leading of the Holy Spirit to be led by the Holy Spirit and be a son. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, people who don't identify as a Christian, who identify as an atheist, and many atheists or agnostics are actually proud of who they are, they get led by the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, it's quite easy for Satan to use demons or Satan himself to influence people. Satan and demons are influencing people's thoughts every day. That's what a thought of the flesh is, and obeying it is an act of the flesh, but the thought comes from Satan. He's influencing people every day. So why isn't it fair that my Holy Spirit can influence non-Christians? Sometimes non-Christians will give you money. Sometimes non-Christians will bless you. Some and, and many people are confused about who Christians are and who non-Christians are. If you've ever talked to a person who says they believe in God, they pray to God every every day, that's a Christian. If you mm -hmm. ask that person, do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Yeah. Do you believe he rose on the third day? Yeah. Do you try and obey his teachings? Yeah. But I just don't go to church. I'm not asking you to go to church. Hey, if you ever want to talk about things with the Bible, if you've ever got any questions, 
you know, take me out for coffee and ask me the questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and I'll never drag you to church. And that's your conversation. And now you've got a person who feels happy to talk to you about Christian things. So there's a lot of people out there that you you label non-Christians, but they're actually Christians. And there's certain non-Christians like uh, uh, Joe Rogan and Elon Musk that I'm happy that they're non-Christians uh, and, and and Christianity would only pervert them. And, uh, and getting sent a book by Matthew and, Getting get get Matthew being able to reach out to Elon Musk and say you want to read some you like Michael Jackson or Princess Diana you want to read some books about them here they are if he could get those books to Elon Musk he might really enjoy that and start reading Christian books but they don't want commitment and they don't want to go to church and they don't want to be a hypocrite they've seen enough hypocrites Elon Musk is so successful that he doesn't follow losers. He doesn't spend quality time with people going nowhere. He He's busy enough doing things. He's not going to hang around Christians that talk all day but don't do anything. He, he probably have Christian friends, but they'd be real Christians, really obeying God, really getting on with it. And he wouldn't hold them in any special love because they're Christians. He'd love them for their actions and what they do and what they achieve. And you can take it personally from me that I love Joe Rogan and I love Elon Musk and um, their reward is waiting in heaven. Thank you. Thank you, God. My next question, which is number six, is how important is developing intimacy with the Holy Spirit? So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll stop at number five. And uh, okay. <laughs> we may do five parts or three parts or whatever. I think that's enough for people to uh, swallow. Um, and uh, and I'm a pretty good preacher, aren't I? <laughs> have, you yeah. ever, have you ever heard, have you ever, Tulu, have you ever heard God preach? No. And does it feel like I'm preaching or does it feel more like a conversation? It feels more like a conversation, but at the same time as well, you're teaching us what we need to know. Yeah. So, which is I really, better? I, I really enjoy you, you know. Uh, Thank you. Jesus told a parable about uh, a father asking his son to go and work in uh, the farm and and the son said, yeah, I will. And then later changed his mind. He asked the second son, uh, go and work in the farm. And the son said no, but later changed his mind and went and worked in the son in 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 the farm. Which was the better son? The second. That's the non-Christians. That's the Elon Musk, Joe Rogan, which prostitute. And the first son? Christians. Christian church, self-righteous Christian, argumentative, judgmental, condescending Christian church. And and they all go to a synagogue called the synagogue of Satan. And you want to look up uh, that verse in Revelation to get some context on it. And maybe you could even check out someone who does a commentary on Revelation and read about what the synagogue of Satan is. Uh, mm -hmm. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Some people, some people will see it. Uh, Matthew will see it on the YouTube uh, analytics, which study how many people watch the video. He'll see the percentage of people that listen to this video right to the end. And he doesn't think it'll be more than 20%. A lot of people would have turned off, especially about that uh, that she's cute little six year old, and a lot of people would have just had too much when they heard that you're cute and innocent yourself. 
And uh, so I've really enjoyed speaking to you. Uh, have you got any other questions? We're finished question five, but have you got any other questions for me before we close off? Yeah, I wanted to say, God, why are we doing all of these videos? What is the purpose? Uh, like like uh, you said, uh, we've interviewed a whole lot of saints. It would be good to interview God. And Matthew was just uh, feeling in a good mood and I uh, thought that he could do 10 of the questions tonight, but I've given such long, comprehensive answers that we've only got five. And so we'll go on and uh, do the next five or the next 10 and uh, see how it goes. But I've really enjoyed talking to you. I've really enjoyed having the ability to speak. And even if only five people per month uh, download this book, um, it'll be worthwhile speaking to those five people. And perhaps we can get 20% uh, to read the whole book. Um, and that would be good. And what if we transform two people's lives? That's as much as Matthew and you. That, that's two other people on the path of righteousness. And remember, the lost sheep aren't the prodigal sons and aren't the brokenhearted. They're the people in the church. The people in the church are lost. They need someone who's righteous, a sinner, to come and share the good news with them. And uh, the lost sheep are the people in the church. Well, the people in the church think they are the found sheep. Yeah, and the lost that that was the a, uh, that was the uh, uh, total turning of the parable to mean the opposite of what it is. But they are really lost. The people in the church are blind, being led by the blind, and they're in a ditch, and. That, that's not a successful way of working, being in a ditch. When you're in a ditch, you can't get out. You and your teacher are in a ditch. The whole church is in a ditch. The whole church is dead. The whole church is asleep. The whole church has got a reputation of being alive, but they're dead. The whole church uh, forms a synagogue of Satan. The church is full of hypocrites. They're blind, they're ignorant and arrogant and judgmental and rude. And they're not the sort of people Matthew likes to hang out with anymore. And so perhaps we're coming closer to the sons of God being released to collect the real harvest that's going to come in. So check out the book Why Revival Tarries around uh, this subject. Um, if you're listening to this video or reading this book, make a note of writing down the book's that I mentioned and go and check them out and invest it on. If you're one or two of those people who are getting impacted by this message, take a note of all the books. They're all 99 cents. Take a note of those books and go and read them for further research. Just like if you're doing a university course and, and the teacher said recommended reading, it's not on the syllabus. It's not part of the syllabus but the teacher really knows his subject and he knows that you really benefit out of those five other books. Uh, think of these uh, out of the syllabus that just suggested reading, but if you're one of those two people who are really resonating with this message, make sure you go and read all the books that are being recommended. God bless you. I bless you. I'll leave you. Uh, if you listen to the end of this video, help Matthew and like the video. If you've got any comments, even you want to bring correction to Matthew, uh, feel free to make a comment. Don't, don't be, don't, if, if you tear strips off Matthew, uh, don't be surprised that Matthew will hide you from his channel so you can never comment again. But uh, the comment will, will be good because that'll help the uh, YouTube video get populated. Uh, if you heard something, you like that, um, uh, this is part of a playlist called Mentoring in the Heavenlies, and uh, that playlist is next to the title. You can click on that for another 100 videos, that, supernatural videos that you might want to watch. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, you want to see more videos of Matthew as he makes them and is inspired by the Holy Spirit, um, 
please subscribe to his channel and uh, then you'll be able to see them and pick each day or each month which videos you want to see. God bless.